Nanotyrannus is back, or at least it might be. When I was at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting last October, I actually heard some hints of this, and this paper was actually submitted very early in November, so it's probably hints about this specific paper, especially since the person giving hints about it is also one of the authors on this paper, so it seems really consistent there. This is actually really exciting, because for a while now, Nanotyrannus has kind of been just up in the air as to whether or not it is or isn't valid. And overall, most researchers had come to the consensus that it probably wasn't. The Nanotyrannus specimens that we do have were probably just juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex. Now, while this paper's conclusion was that Nanotyrannus is valid and should be considered a valid taxon as opposed to something that's just a juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex, that's not necessarily going to be perfectly accepted by all of the researchers. There's still going to be a lot of arguments and debates about this, and I fully expect people to be discussing it on the floor at the different panels at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting this year in 2024. Now, as for why this is important, the first Nanotyrannus specimen, and I'm just going to refer to all of the juvenile specimens as Nanotyrannus unless I state otherwise, was first found in 1946, and it was thought to be actually Gorgosaurus, another kind of Tyrannosaur that lived before Tyrannosaurus rex. That said, later research in 1988 found, hey, this is actually probably its own thing and may not actually be closely related to Tyrannosaurus rex. This is where the name Nanotyrannus actually comes from. If this is true and Nanotyrannus is valid, it would be very interesting, because from what we understand of the late Cretaceous North America, especially from places like the Hell Creek Formation, there wasn't necessarily a good distribution of predator sizes. Both Kat Schroeder and Thomas Holtz have done work on this recently, and I'm using Kat Schroeder's diagram here because it's wonderful. You can see exactly what they mean by there's not a lot of mid-sized predators. And if Nanotyrannus is valid, you can see where it would help to fill in this massive gap in adult sizes that we do have based on the current fossil record. But that's, of course, dependent on if it is valid. So what does this paper actually give as its reasons for Nanotyrannus being valid? And the first thing they did is they looked at a lot of the fossils. It's kind of what you got to do. But they also looked at very specific features that are less likely to change, at least according to these authors, during ontogeny. That is, as an organism grows up. You can think about that with even human babies, where they have this giant head and then they kind of grow into that. That's the ontogenetic change of the body proportions. So potentially, if there are some changes, Tyrannosaurus rex was just doing the same thing with the Nanotyrannus specimens still just being juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex. It's something that we needed to test, and these authors did that with a lot of different bones. Now, they did look at a ton of features as well, especially on the skull, so I'm just going to show you the images here, and you can pause on your own time if you're interested. Starting off, here's the maxilla. And then there's the lacrimal bone here, the nasal bones here, the post-orbital bones here, the jugal bones here, the squamosal bones here, the ectopterygoid bones here, the syringular bone here, and finally the dentary bones here. Looking at those images, you can tell there's a lot of difference. The question then becomes, is it too much difference for ontogeny to cover for? Using the maxilla as an example, is it possible for that maxillary fenestra to actually move and become more hidden from the side during the animal's growth? What they found, based on some relatives of Tyrannosaurus, is no. And they did this with two main organisms. The first is Gorgosaurus, but the second one that I think is even better is Tarbosaurus, which was very closely related to Tyrannosaurus rex and would have lived in what's now Mongolia and parts of China. We have a great growth series for Tarbosaurus, which means we could really compare and see how certain structures in both the adults and the young skulls do seem very similar, such so as having a tall orbits and the location of the promaxillary fenestra, as well as the shape of the orbital bar on the lacrimal bone, as well as many more features. So based on Tarbosaurus, one of Tyrannosaurus rex's closest relatives, it doesn't seem that likely like it would have been able to go through so much ontogenetic change. In order to further test this, they also did some morphometric analyses, and what you end up with is the Nanotyrannus or juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex specimens all grouping together, almost no middle ground, and then just Tyrannosaurus rex as adults. So seemingly there's just two entirely different morphotypes that were existing, and we really don't have any intermediate types. There's also other outliers, like when you look at the hands of Tyrannosaurus and Nanotyrannus, where Nanotyrannus, while being smaller in body size, actually had larger hand claws than what we see in Tyrannosaurus rex, and I'll talk more about that later. 
They also did bone histology though to try and understand the growth of these animals, and this is mostly data taken from other papers because there's been a lot of work like this done on Tyrannosaurus rex. However, very importantly in some of the younger specimens of potentially Tyrannosaurus rex, like the famous Jane specimen, they looked at it and went, hey, this is actually slowing down its growth, meaning it potentially was reaching near adulthood. And it would have still been much smaller than an adult Tyrannosaurus rex, meaning that potentially it's just not a Tyrannosaurus rex. Certain rugose or wrinkly textures on some of the bones in the skull of animals like Jane also help to indicate that it was approaching adulthood. This is something we see in adult Tyrannosaurs, but not young ones. So it really does seem possible that some of these Nanotyranna specimens were approaching adulthood, and that they may have had a slightly different growth rate than Tyrannosaurus rex. And they actually plot these on the same graph, so you can see that potentially, yes, there was just a smaller Tyrannosaur in the same environment as Tyrannosaurus rex. They then also did phylogenetic research using many different matrices from different authors. And what they were able to find is that it's either very close to the base of the Tyrannosaur ids, so it'd be a non Tyrannosaur id Tyrannosaur oid, or potentially just inside the Tyrannosaur ids. But again, not directly related to Tyrannosaurus rex, something that's very interesting. Because of these many lines of evidence, the authors do suggest that no, Nanotyrannus is its own thing. It would have been living alongside Tyrannosaurus rex, and it's not an actual growth series into Tyrannosaurus rex. This is really interesting, and it brings up a whole ton of questions, like why haven't we found any actual juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex? But also, why are we only finding this kind of almost fully grown size of Nanotyrannus? There's more questions to ask here, just based on their data, but it is very interesting data. Additionally, I do at least want to propose a few reasons for some of the patterns we're seeing. One of them is simply that, yeah, maybe Tyrannosaurus rex just underwent even more extreme ontogenetic change than any of the other Tyrannosaurs. Now, to be fair to the authors, they did try to base this around certain characters that are less likely to change ontogenetically. However, we don't know that for sure, and maybe with Tyrannosaurus rex, it just, again, did that to an even more extreme level, so it did change those features. It's hard to know for sure without more data, and especially more specimens, so get out there and find more. Additionally, when looking at the slower lines of arrested growth that indicate slowing growth rate, it is potentially likely that these animals just died early and weren't able to hunt as well. For example, a series of injuries could have slowed down something like Jane's hunting ability, meaning that potentially just grew less because it couldn't collect as much food during the certain growth seasons. And then eventually, because of those injuries, it did die early. It's not really just as straightforward as saying, hey, look, it was slowing down its growth, and it was definitely because it was reaching sub-adulthood. And as for the claws, I actually think that the fact that the Nanotyrannus claws are larger does bring up a very interesting question for the Tyrannosaurids. And that's simply, maybe they had arms still, but reduced arms, because they didn't need them as adults, but still needed them as young. What could potentially be the case here is, if Nanotyrannus is actually just juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex, maybe they needed them more for hunting and grappling prey. Meanwhile, later as they got larger, they actually were able to reabsorb some of that calcium in those finger claws, and this is something we've seen in other animals, such as Triceratops, where again, great growth series, the young had these little triangular typed horns on the back of their frill, and lost them as they got older. So it's very possible that that could have also been one of these roots for why we're seeing some of these differences. My favorite idea though is potentially it could just be dimorphism, which sounds really odd, but when you look at certain animals like certain types of garter snakes, there are massive size differences between the females and the males. And especially when you're something that weighs many multiples of tons, potentially having smaller males could make the mating process much easier, because you're not dealing with two multi-ton animals, just one multi-ton animal and one that weighs maybe a ton. And that may have made that entire lifestyle and that part of their lives much easier. Again, it's really, really hard to know, and I think these are very intriguing questions that this paper has helped to bring up, because it's actually re-looking at many different parts of the data and suggesting something that hasn't been suggested for a while. And I'm sure that this will help lay the groundwork for even better paleontological research in the future.